everyone. This is Kim um, with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Service. I also have with me Tanya Butler. Most of you know her. And then we have Mike Maddox, who has recently started working uh, at the department on the opioid initiative. So today's webinar is on Hep C. Um, the statements of work, I'm not sure if they've all been sent out or not, but we will be sending those by email. Um, we combined them this year, so all of your money is all on one sole source contract. So it will be for medication, for flex, for training and technology, and also for um, Hep C screens and tests. Um, you will have money in there based on the people that you are serving for SOR, for people that um, are at risk for hep C that do not have means to pay for the screens and tests themselves. We will be sending out information on that at a later date. I know you probably will have some questions, but just put those on a back burner. Um, we won't be able to answer those today. So I want to go ahead and ask you to, um, to make sure that your phone is on mute. And then I want to introduce our speaker. Her name is Sally Bouse. She is with the Oklahoma State Department of Health. And she is the Administrative Programs Manager for Prevention and Intervention, Sexual Harm, and Harm Reduction Service. And I will put my phone on mute and turn it over for her for the webinar. And we really appreciate this, Sally. Thank you. No problem. Good morning, everyone. Like she said, my name is Sally, and I work for the Oklahoma State Department of Health for what was previously called the HIV STD service. We are in the process of changing our name to Sexual Health and Harm Reduction Services. And this is just one of the steps that we're taking to help to reduce stigma around STDs and hepatitis C, hepatitis B, and drug user health. And um, it's something that we are really excited about. I've been with the service for 23 years. I've been everything from a disease intervention specialist, a health educator, I've done community planning. I recently was over the viral hepatitis program and now I'm under the Prevention and Intervention Branch. I'm the Programs Manager for that. So we'll go ahead and get started. If I can get my slide to move, there we go. Hepatitis C is the globe's biggest infectious disease killer. And although that is the case, it's not one that we often hear about. You hear a lot about HIV AIDS, but you don't hear as much about hepatitis C that now kills more Americans than any other infectious disease. The Centers in Disease control, of, of Disease Control, they estimated that the hep C-related deaths reached an all-time high of 19,659 in 2014. Also in 2013, hep C-related deaths were greater than the combined total of deaths related to 60 other major infections that are reportable, which in HIV, pneumococcal disease, tuberculosis, and um, because it's based upon death certificates and underreported, it's likely underestimated. So how many people are living with viral hepatitis in the United States? In 2016, there are an estimated 2.4 million people in 2016, a total of 2,967 cases of acute hepatitis C reported to the CDC. That doesn't sound like very much when you're thinking of the whole nation, but so many people do not have any symptoms or know that they have hepatitis C that their illness is often missed, and so it's underreported and therefore it's not counted. They estimate that the actual number of acute hep C cases was almost 41,200 in 2016. And then there's another 700,000 to 1.4 million people living with chronic hepatitis B. When we look in Oklahoma in 2017, we had 81 cases of acute hepatitis C. 
Again, that doesn't sound like a whole much, but remember that you have to have very specific symptoms and very specific testing at the right time for us to diagnose you with acute hepatitis C. If you look at the numbers of our acutes, the uh, highest was in the 30 to 39, but that's just a few cases of difference from anybody from the ages of 20 to 39. Also, we see that the 75.4% of those cases report injection drug use. And with acute cases that we're able to identify, those folks are actually interviewed by a county health department nurse, and they talk to them about their risks where we get a better idea, and then also about protecting their health, protecting their liver, and it also helps us look out for how people are becoming infected. Second highest to that is tattooing. We really don't think that it, those specific people may have gotten it from a tattoo as long as it's at a, a licensed tattoo parlor. But as we know, in Oklahoma, we have plenty of scratchers or prison tattoos, you know, not done in a professional setting, not done and with the right sterilization. But then again, let's look at chronic cases. We had 2,078 chronic cases, so a whole lot more. Those are people that have had hep C for a long time, or maybe we missed their acute infection because they didn't have symptoms at that time. With chronic hepatitis C, we don't have the capacity to keep up with and interview each chronic. One thing that we do know about hepatitis C, it's the number one killer, but it's also one of the most poorly funded diseases. Currently, there are 14 states that are funded by the CDC to do hep C surveillance. We uh, are one of those states, but it's not a program that's paid for nationwide yet. Hopefully, that will be coming next year, so we'll get, as a nation, a lot better picture of hepatitis C because now if they don't have that funding, they're, they're just having to come up with state money. If we look at the race ethnicity here with the chronic hepatitis C, you see that the highest rate is in whites, but what's concerning is you look here at the American Indians, and both with chronic and acute, the, their uh, ethnicity and race experiences more infections because they make up less of the population. And then multiple race also encompasses a lot. We see more males in Oklahoma than we do, and it's, you know, about here it's 64 to 34%. So what is hepatitis? Hepatitis can be lots of different kinds of hepatitis. It is a general term for inflammation of the liver and also refers to a group of viral infections that can affect the liver. The most common types are hep A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. And it's the leading cause of liver cancer and the most common reason for liver transplants. When you think about what your liver does, it's the largest internal organ and it's on your upper right hand side behind the rib cage. It has the unique ability to re regenerate itself, and it's responsible for over 500 bodily functions, and it detoxifies drug and toxins. It plays that important role in digestion of sugar and fat, metabolism, and nutrient storage. Also stores vitamins and minerals. It helps to make proteins to clot the blood. It filters all substances, ones that we breathe, as well as substances absorbed through the skin and taken by mouth. Now, symptoms of hepatitis, all types are similar and can include some of the following. Loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, fever. People really report fatigue. They say, I'm, I'm just so tired all the time, or once I get home from work, I'm so absolutely worn out that I just have to lay down. There's nothing I can do. Also, joint pain, gray-colored bowel movements, and jaundice. Now, a lot of people seem to think that 
you know, if I have hepatitis, I will know it because everything is going to turn yellow. That is not the case, particularly with hepatitis C. A lot of people may just think they have the crud that's going around. They may feel bad when they first become infected for a, a short period of time, so they just write it off, and um, a lot of people do not experience that jaundice. When we look at hepatitis B, it uh, can range in severity from a mild illness lasting a few weeks to a serious long-life illness. The hepatitis B virus is 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV, which makes it easily transmitted. When you're talking about bloodborne infections, hepatitis B is the most infectious, followed by hep C, followed by HIV. HIV, once it's outside the body, dies very quickly. Hepatitis B can survive outside the body for at least a week. Also, during that time, the virus can still cause infection if it enters the body of a person who is not infected. It's spread, all hepatitis B, C, HIV is spread the same, blood, semen, or another bodily fluid from a person infected with hepatitis B gets inside your body. <clears throat> but by sharing needles, syringes, other drug injection equipment, sexual contact with an infected person, needle sticks, or other sharp instrument injuries, and it can be transmitted mother to baby. So when somebody gets hepatitis B, their potential to clear it or become chronic. For babies, it's greater than 90%. If mom has hepatitis B, there's a 90 to 95% chance that baby will become infected uh, during pregnancy or during birth. There's a 25 to 50% chance in children aged one to five years and six to 10% in older children and adults. Most persons with acute disease recover with no lasting liver damage and acute illness is rarely fatal. 15 to 25% of chronically infected persons will develop chronic liver disease, cirrhosis, liver failure, or liver cancer. There's no medication available, uh, and that's not necessarily that true anymore. They do supportive treatment. They do viral medications that the goal with hepatitis B is the same with HIV. Keep that virus very low, and it doesn't damage the liver as quickly. Also, they need regular uh, monitoring for progression to liver disease. The best thing about Hep B is there's a vaccination. Get vaccinated if it increased risk. In Oklahoma, infants are vaccinated at birth. That is uh, not true in all states, but we are a birth dose state. Also, do not share needles to inject drugs, tattooing equipment, razors or toothbrushes, glucometers. Pregnant women absolutely should be screened for hepatitis B. And vaccination should be administered to unvaccinated adults that have diabetes or, her, or who are aged 19 to 59 years. And also standard precautions which involve possible exposure to blood and body fluids. The reason why women really must be tested and, and we don't have a problem with them not being tested at this time is because we have a perinatal hepatitis B prevention program. So when we find out that mom has hepatitis B, we have a coordinator that follows them, speaks with the doctor's office, speaks with the hospital, and we do an intervention where we provide what's called HBIG, or hepatitis B immunoglobulin, and the baby is given that and the first dose of hep B vaccine in the 12 hours of birth within, as well as we follow them to make sure they receive the two additional doses of vaccine, as well as testing to make sure that the vaccine worked because this child is going to be living in a home with somebody that has hepatitis B. If this intervention is completed, instead of having a 90 to 95% chance of being infected at birth, it reverts it to a 95% chance that they will not be infected. So it's very important. We can do that intervention, 90% 
95% chance of preventing infection being passed on to the baby. Hang on one second, Sally. Can you please make sure to mute your phones? We're hearing some background noise. Just make sure your phones are on mute. Yeah, I just let it ring. Wait, I can hear someone talking in the background. Can you please make sure to mute your phones? Are we ready? Yes. Okay. So let's talk now about hepatitis C. Like I said earlier, it is the most common chronic bloodborne infection in the United States. Many people don't know how or when they got infected. It's a leading cause of liver transplant and also causes liver cancer. It can survive outside the body at room temperature on environmental surface surfaces for up to three weeks. The incubation period is two weeks to six months. With hep C, 20 to 30% of newly infected persons develop uh, symptoms of chronic disease. So that tells us that a lot of people do not develop symptoms of acute disease. Approximately 15 to 25% of persons clear the virus from their bodies without treatment and do not develop chronic infection. We're not real sure exactly, you know, what's different in some people. When the person that is infected, you know, hepatitis C mounts an immune response, they get an immune response to the virus, but during replication of the virus during infection, it can result in changes in the hep C virus which evade the immune system. So that's where they think that some people may uh, develop the chronic condition. Again, it's spread like HIV and hepatitis B. It's when infected blood usually enters the body, and they also, from sharing needles, syringes, equipment to inject drugs, needle stick injuries, and being born to a mother who has hepatitis C. Most people become infected through injection drug use when they're sharing those syringes or other equipment to inject drugs. It's important if you're talking to uh, drug users that you know to explain that that in can include cotton, cookers, anything that comes in contact with blood. So even if they have their own clean syringe and everything like that, if they are sticking their needle down into the same cooker where they've melted that drugs that other people do, they theoretically could draw hepatitis C up that way. Amounts of blood that are too small to be seen can still transmit hepatitis C. Then also, you know, they can reduce their risk by cleaning their needles with bleach. It may provide some protection, but it hasn't been proven. Occupational exposures, unlike hepatitis B, hep C is not as efficiently transmitted from a needle stick. It usually ranges about 1.8. In some studies, it has been as high as 7 to 10 percent. The bigger the needle, the more likely that the person can be infected that way. Approximately six of every hundred infants born to moms with hepatitis C become infected with the virus. Uh, it happens at the time of birth. There's currently no prophylaxis available to prevent it. There are some studies going on, so hopefully in the future we will have some type of intervention. The risk is increased by the presence of maternal HCV viremia, so that makes uh, the risk two to three times greater if they're co-infected with HIV. So if mom gets hep C while she's pregnant and has really high viral load, that's not good uh, as far as transmission goes. Most infants infected with hep C at birth have no symptoms and do well during childhood. And now we do know that the medications are able to be used in adolescents uh, and they're doing studies also in younger children. There's no evidence that breastfeeding spreads hepatitis C. However, they should consider abstaining from breast. Their nipples are cracked or bleeding. 
that is not the case with Hep B and Hep C. They do not breastfeed, or HIV and Hepatitis B, they should not breastfeed with those. When babies are born to moms, when you're testing for antibodies, you need to wait at least 18 months because babies get antibodies at birth from their moms and then their immune system clears mom's antibodies at about 18 months. So if you are testing an infant, it needs to be a viral load test because an antibody test is just going to tell you about the mom. Less commonly, a person can also get hep C virus through sharing personal care items, implements that may have come in contact with another person's blood. So it's really important when you're, if you're talking to people that have hep C, say, have your own razor, have your own nail clippers, nail files, toothbrush, and keep those out of the reach of others, particularly children. Less commonly, a person can also get hep C through uh, having sexual contact with the person that's infected with hepatitis C. The risk is low, it's zero to three percent. We don't see infections among uh, partners that have been together for a long time and are only having sex with each other. The risk increases if a person has a sexually transmitted disease or HIV sex with multiple partners, rough sex where bleeding or blood is more likely, and a person should practice safer sex using latex, polyurethane, and barriers for oral sex. What's the risk of acquiring it from a, a blood transfusion? Now there's a lot of advanced screening tests, so the risk is considered to be less than one chance per two million units transfused. Now, before 1992, if somebody had a blood transfusion and they've never been tested, they, never, they need to be tested. That's where you see the baby boomer commercials from. If you were born from 1945 to 1965, you should be tested at least once because those folks that fall in that, if they're not injection drug users, if they had medical procedures or blood transfusions, may be at risk. Within a household, uh, transmission has occurred, but not very often. It's most likely a result of direct through the skin exposure to blood or an infected household member. So if somebody's taking care of somebody with hep C that's very sick, they need to use gloves. There has been hep C and HIV transmission through a caretaker taking care of others with bloody diarrhea and that kind of thing. They didn't wear gloves, they had cracked hands. So who needs to be tested? It's recommended for anyone at increased risk for HCV infection, including those baby boomers born 1945 through 65, persons who have ever injected drugs, including those who injected only once many years ago. If a person concentrates made before 1987, recipients of blood transfusions before July of 1992, if they've ever received long-term hemodialysis, people with known exposures to hepatitis C, all people with HIV, patients with signs or symptoms of liver disease, and children born to hepatitis C positive moms. There's the uh, several tests in the book for their screening test, which is an antibody test that includes the rapid test as an antibody test. Then you follow with qualitative tests to detect the presence or absence of the virus. Because if you remember from earlier, I said up to 25% of people clear hep C on their own. Because they have cleared it though, they will test positive for the antibody. Even if they've cleared it, even after treatment, you have to test for presence of the virus. How soon can it be detected? It can be detected with four to 10 weeks after infection with an antibody test and a greater than 90% of persons by six months after exposure. So if, if somebody was exposed, we'd do an immediate test, we'd do one in, uh, about 10 weeks, 
then another six months just to be sure. RNA appears in the blood sooner and can be detected as early as two to three weeks after infection. So if you look here at laboratory markers for people that have acute hepatitis C, so anti-HCV, that's the antibody test that is, is always going to remain positive. If you see the blue bar, HCV RNA is... Hello, this is Elma Rowan Edwards from Hope. Thank you. Make sure you have your phone on mute. There's someone else out there that still does not have their phone on mute. Uh, that person recently put their phone on hold and we could hear the background music, so please Please, everyone, check your phone. Make sure you have it on mute. Thank okay. you. Go ahead, Sally. If you look at the blue bar, which is HCV RNA, that is the first one that's detected. Then we also see a spike in what's called ALT. That's a liver enzyme. That if it is high, you know something is going on with the liver. So if you were looking at somebody that had been exposed you would test first for HCV RNA. You would watch there between one to uh, <clears throat> two months for their ALT spike, and then about that same time, their antibody is going to uh, be positive. Animal right. Their ALT can go up and down depending upon on liver damage. So. Uh, that's kind of just what I said. If, if you're testing for recent exposure, you do the antibody test, RNA, and ALT. Four weeks from suspected time, you repeat that, and at 12 weeks again. You guys really shouldn't have to uh, worry about this because you're just going to be providing screening for clients. This is the recommended testing sequence, which is good to know. It starts with the HCV antibody. If it's non-reactive, no antibody detective, and you can stop as long as they have not been exposed in the last six months. If it's reactive, then you do that HCV RNA. If it's not detected, there is no current infection. It does mean that they have had hep C before. If it's detected, that's a current hepatitis C infection, and they should be linked to further services. Most people who get hep C will develop chronic infection. And following acute infection, it's very successful at establishing that persistent infection, evading the immune system, and uh, it has a high rate of viral persistence that's not completely understood. The rate of viral production is high. It's 10 to 10 to 10 to 12 virons per day. And uh, the lack of proofreading by viral polymerase leads to enormous diversity, which in creates a major challenge for the host immune response. Also, is there's been some studies that indicate the clearance of hepatitis C is associated with strong and persistent cytotoxic T lymphocyte and CD4 lymphocyte responses. Also, persons who clear hepatitis C generally have limited viral diversity, which also helps their immune system prevent it from becoming chronic. The actual rate of chronicity uh, following initial infection is not well established. Uh, it's estimated because we don't have all the reports, but that best estimate is that 75 to 85% of persons infected with hep C will become chronic. With chronic patients, they do need to see that health professional regularly, eat a normal diet, avoid alcohol and other drugs, get tested, and if not immunized, get immunized for A and B. And um, always, always anybody with hepatitis needs to discuss anti and all medications with their medical provider because a lot of supplements, herbal products, different things like that, 
may affect the liver. Also, people with hepatitis, it's not recommended that you take Tylenol or acetaminophen because that is uh, one of the pain relievers that has high effects on the liver. People that do clear hepatitis C usually are younger, of female gender, of non-black race, Also, if you are symptomatic during acute infection, you know, when people do have those symptoms and they do turn yellow, that also gives us a picture of your immune system's response to that infection. Also, it's important to have normal immune status. Also, there is a genotype, the 1L28BCC genotype. And that has uh, been associated with the probability of clearance, but we can't go around testing people for genotypes. It's better just to get them to prevent infection. Also, a small percentage of persons with chronic hep C can develop other conditions that are related to their hep C. Diabetes occurs three times more likely if a person has uh, hep C. A type of kidney disease that causes inflammation of the kidney, also a condition involving presence of abnormal proteins in the blood. Also there is heme production problems that causes skin fragility and blistering. Also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So hepatitis C treatment. Hopefully you guys have seen maybe some commercials or some different things and, and there's getting to be more information about hep C. It's like drug HIV development only at warp speed. In the four to five years that I've been working in hepatitis, the drugs have come out really quickly. So with confirmed HCV infection, the person needs to be referred to a provider. And the medications now are very, very easy. You know, a lot of times we run onto clients and their hesitancy for being tested is they're like, oh, you know, my aunt was, test, was treated 20 years ago and it about killed her. They gave her shots of stuff. She had to quit and it didn't help anyway. The old treatment was very brutal and could last for 18 months and only cleared usually about 70% of infections. So now these pills are one pill a day in most cases, and they have 90% and greater cure rates, although they are very expensive. A person may need to see a specialist, especially if they have lots of liver issues with their hepatitis C. And then hep C is not exactly the same across all folks. It has six major genotypes globally. In the U.S., we see genotype 1 the most commonly. That's about 75% of all infections, followed by genotype 2 and 3. Genotypes 4, 5, and 6, we are seeing more in the United States, especially among foreign-born patients from Asia and Africa. The good thing is, is now many of the medications have become what's called pan-genotypic, which means they work on all genotypes. Really important, people with hepatitis C should be tested for hepatitis B before starting any therapy. There have been cases where hepatitis B has reactivated during DAA therapy for hepatitis C. And the severity of cases have ranged from mild to what's called severe fulminant liver injury that can be life-threatening. Also, uh, anybody with hep C should have for sure hep B vaccination as well as hep A. The good thing about that is for adults, we have a combo vaccine for A and B that will do it at the same time. Also, they need to have that test for hepatitis DNA to make sure and see the status of hep B, and then monitoring those patients carefully. So these are some of the commercial or some of the drug names you may have seen, Harvoni, Solvaldi, Vicuripac, 
Zepatier. There's some other new ones on the market, Maverick. So the wholesale acquisition cost, this doesn't necessarily mean it's what everybody will pay because there's 340B pricing, there's other, but at the current time, the wholesale acquisition cost for treatment ranges from $25,020 to $189,000 per treatment, and that's anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks of treatment. So it is still very, very expensive. And in Oklahoma, we experience a lot of people that fall through the cracks of the system. They don't have private insurance. They can't qualify for Medicaid. So we have a lot of holes when it comes to getting people cured from hepatitis C. Some federally qualified health centers are beginning to treat and a lot of times we can, based upon a person's income, uh, get the drugs for free through a pharmaceutical program. So how many people are going to need it? Well, all of people need it, but about 25% of people with chronic disease develop severe liver disease. Uh, it is cost effective compared to a liver transplant. Most people won't need a liver transplant, but it's still shown cost effective to cure people of hepatitis C. Also, there's treatment as prevention models in development. So that's really getting people treated, cured, where they don't pass, upon, don't pass that infection on. So what should we say to clients who test positive? They should be informed about the low but present risk for transmission with their sex partners. Don't share any personal items that may have blood on them, such as toothbrushes or razors, and can pose risk to others. A lot of families have had scares because it's very common to leave your razor in the bathtub and then a child has decided to try to shave their legs for the first time. So it's important for people to realize to keep those, all those implements somewhere else. Pets and sores on the skin should be covered to keep from spreading infectious blood or secretions. Do not donate blood, organs, tissue, or semen. And it is not spread by sneezing, hugging, holding hands, coughing, sharing, eating utensils, or drinking glasses, or through food or water. So a really important thing to advise them until they can be treated they should be advised to protect their liver from future harm. They're advised to avoid alcohol because it can accelerate cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease. Also, any, like I said earlier, any new prescription over-the-counter, aspirin pain relievers, or any supplements that can potentially damage the liver. Here is a study that actually showed even light drinking spikes cancer risk and hepatitis C related cirrhosis. So it really needs to be, you know, cut alcohol out. Avoid cigarettes, drugs, or any substance that can harm the liver. Avoid raw or undercooked shellfish. Avoid high doses of vitamins or supplements except where directed by a medical provider. Do eat right, get vaccinated against hepatitis A and hepatitis B if not already protected. People with hep C, HIV, hepatitis B should not be restricted from working in occupational settings. There's no evidence of transmission from food handlers, teachers, or other service providers. The one that we hear about with uh, occupational settings or particularly food is hepatitis A. Hepatitis A, they're currently in uh, having outbreaks across the nation. Knock on wood, we have not experienced that in Oklahoma. This has a huge link to injection drug use. It's not by going to eat at the restaurant like it can be. Hep A is one of those that it's fecal to oral transmission, which means somebody went to the bathroom, got poop on their hands, did not wash their hands. They have Hep A. They fix your food and you ingest it. So we're not seeing that particular problem. Any occupation, you know, if a person obviously is bleeding, 
they need to step out of the situation, but any occupation should not be of danger. With HIV and HCV co-infection, people living with HIV are at increased risk for hepatitis because of the same behaviors that lead to HIV infection. It progresses faster among people living with HIV. So it's really important if someone tests positive for HIV that they know their hepatitis C and hepatitis B function and be vaccinated if they are not vaccinated. About one quarter of HIV infected persons in the United States are, have hepatitis C. Co-infection is common 50 to 90% among HIV infected drug users. It progresses more rapidly. It also can impact the course and management of HIV infection. So that is exactly where a person would be seeing a specialist, seeing an infectious disease doctor that specializes in HIV and HCV co-infection. So again, we're going to refer to their PCP for further testing, FQHCs, or they may have their own private pay insurance. So what do some people do because hep C is, and being treated is uh, so expensive? There are assistance programs. There's copay programs because even though you may have insurance, that qualifies as a specialty drug, and your copays can be quite high. Patient advocacy programs that offer free hepatitis B or C drugs to lower income people who are uninsured or underinsured and do not qualify for Medicaid or Medicare. In Oklahoma, if they do qualify for Medicaid, their treatment is being provided. Other patient advocacy programs exist. And where I go for the most up-to-date listing of hepatitis assistance programs is this top one with the red arrow, hepmag.com. When somebody calls me and wants to know about assistance programs, I go to the link that day because this keeps it, they keep a very updated list of current uh, programs and it's easier than me maintaining a list for myself. There also, Hepatitis C Online is a free educational website from the University of Washington. This is um, geared towards medical providers, although it's open and welcome to anybody. There are CEUs that are available there, and it is a really, really good online educational website. Also, the American Liver Foundation, they have an online information resource uh, center for hepatitis C. There's also some other foundations, Patient Advocate, they help with hepatitis C along with a other host of uh, infections and diseases. And also their co they have a copay relief uh, program as well. Patient Access Network, they cover several different conditions and the Health Well Foundation as well. So there are some options to help people. What's really kicked off things in Oklahoma in the last year for hep C is there was a study that came out in January that estimated that the prevalence, or which means amount of hep C in Oklahoma was number two in the nation only behind DC. So that really helped us get a lot of traction and ground and we're planning for hep C elimination plans and some different things that will be going out to the state. Also, ending the HIV epidemic is something we're working on to, as well and we're going to join those two processes together. But we do have the tools to end these epidemics. With hep C, we have the curative therapy. And with HIV, we know, and an easy way to remember is U, the letter U equals the letter U, which means undetectable means untransmittable. So we know that if we get somebody that has HIV on medications, as quickly as possible as after we have found out that they're infected and get their virus undetectable, they're unable to transmit the virus. Also, you may have heard of PrEP, P-R-E-P. -E 
that is an HIV medication that those that are at very high risk for HIV can take that prevents them from becoming infected. And it's one pill a day as well, and most insurances are covering that. And then there's a couple programs in, throughout the state, uh, one in Oklahoma City and one in Tulsa, I believe, where people can get those drugs at a reduced cost or through programs as well. So a lot's going to be happening in hepatitis C and HIV in Oklahoma in the next year. Uh, if you're interested in working on any of those processes, feel free to contact me. We would be glad to have anybody help us. You know, pharmaceutical companies also have patient assistance programs. That's where people can go through and get their drugs that way. Um, Medicaid in Oklahoma does treat. DOC, you might have seen in the news, asked for $90 million to treat hep C in their budget. They did not get the $90 million, but they did get $10 million to treat people in prison for hepatitis C, which is very important because about 90% of people are going to get out of prison, and if we can cure their infection there, then they're not going to come out and transmit that to anybody else. The Oklahoma Department of Corrections has about an 11% positivity rate within their facilities. So that is a really important place where we can make a difference and reduce those numbers of infections. But again, it's still not enough money for all. So we're looking at some other things that other states have done in order, order to be able to try to procure the meds cheaper. Some other states have done what's called a subscription model, nicknamed the Netflix model, and the utility of that is that it's an easy way to think about it. How you pay, if, if you sign up for Netflix, you pay a certain amount for 30 days and you can watch all you want in those 30 days. It's the same concept. States are saying to a pharmaceutical company, they're putting out requests for bids, and they're saying, we have this much money and we'll give you that to, spend, to use as much of the medication we can in a period of time. Louisiana and Washington have been successful, and so that is something we are looking at and uh, moving on. Also, we're uh, submitting what's called a DON, which is, uh, I just completely forgot what it stands for. <laughs> anyway which will allow state agencies to use federal funds to support syringe services. Currently, syringe services are not available legally in Oklahoma. We have very strict paraphernalia laws in which syringes fall under. We uh, are working on that. There's a very organized group in Tulsa and they are working with a couple legislators. That's actually where the legislative ask will probably come from. But in the next legislative session, we are hoping that syringe service programs pass, and that is something that we'll be able to spend our uh, money for our DON, which is determination of need. And then that will cover all state agencies and entities and allow them to use federal funds. And you can pay for everything except with those federal funds except for syringes and cookers. And you cannot pay for fentanyl test strips, which is a strange one to me. Because um, we do have a lot of fentanyl problems in Oklahoma where that's mixed in with uh, heroin. So if you're supportive of syringe exchange and uh, if your agency allows you to talk to legislators, talk to your legislator. If you're, like me, not allowed from the agency on your personal time, I encourage you to talk to your legislators and uh, talk about your support of syringe exchange and why it's in, important both health-wise for Oklahomans and communicable disease-wise. Okay, let's talk a few minutes about, on the rapid testing, what facilities need to provide rapid tests. Um, the rapid testing is a finger stick test. It's not difficult to perform. 
you poke somebody's finger, you get a little sample of blood, you put it into a little tube, and you stick what looks like a pregnancy test down into that tube, and it takes 20 minutes, and that oral, or I'm sorry, that blood will be drawn up. Um, at, the, at this time, the rapid hep C is not approved for oral fluid, but some HIV tests are. So uh, there's only one, there are several HIV tests and only one rapid hepatitis C test that's waived under CLIA, which is the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. Waived tests uh, must use unprocessed specimens, so we're going to be using whole blood, easy to use, and have little risk of an incorrect result. They can be used in many clinical, non-clinical test sites, including community. You know, we have people out that do these tests in their car on folks. Um, so any agency that's going to perform these waived rapid tests are considered a clinical laboratory. Non-clinical sites that plan to offer waived rapid tests must either apply for their own CLIA certificate of waiver or establish an agreement to work under a CLIA certificate of an existing laboratory. They also require that any facility planning to perform the WAVE test must have a quality assurance plan, step-by-step -step activities that ensure testing is carried out correctly, results are accurate, and mistakes are found and corrected. Um, also, if you're going to do the rapid test, you got to certify the manufacturer that you agree to comply with specific requirements. Uh, sale is restricted, so I'm going to show you coming up here how and where you buy the test from. Quality assurance plan in place. Staff have been trained to perform the test using the manufacturer's instructions and then clients receive a subject information pamphlet before the test is given and receive appropriate information when test results are provided. It's really not as difficult as it sounds. It's pretty state straightforward. You can attain your application from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid website or from the State Health Department. It has four pages, and it's just general information, type of certificate requested, type of laboratory, hours uh, of laboratory testing, times you plan on doing the testing, estimating the number of tests you will be performing annually. Um, you're not going to, uh, you're going to only be performing wave, wave tests. Type of control. Um, Check the type of organization for which you're making this application, director affiliation with other laboratories, individuals involved in laboratory testing, consent, and signature. It's valid for two years, and a renewal application needs to be completed and sent to the state agency not less than nine months before the certificate's expiration date, and the fee for a CLIA waiver is $150. This is where, who you contact. You really don't need to go through CMS unless you just want to download the application. You contact Protective Health Services medical facilities. You could just shoot an email to this email address. Terry Cook is there, and um, they are the specialist and can facilitate you through this process that is absolutely not as hard as it sounds. Our service division even has its own CLIA waiver for our employees that participate in screening events and that kind of thing. So um, if you are not directly have a lab or working under a lab, you will need your own CLIA waiver. Also, we recommend, although it's not required, we do have an HIV counseling testing and referral course that includes HCV testing and counseling clients. It does not include how to perform the test, although if somebody requested that, that was coming, we'd be happy to show you how. Also, Orisure is the company that sells rapid HCV tests. This is who you would order them from. And it's Pam Pitts, and she's the Director of Sales for Public Health, which you guys will fall under uh, uh, that way, 
you can also uh, ask her, you could email her and find out. That's where you would get price quotes and that type of information on what you're going to purchase. Also, Orisure has trainers that are available. The current person has uh, left the company and they're in the process of refilling that position, but there is training available and again, uh, through that H HIV CTR course that could be pro provided upon request. What kind of questions does anyone have? You do have to unmute yourself if you're going to ask a question. Hi, Sally. My name is Pamela Ray. Hi. I would like to know, is there any way that you could send me a copy of these slides? Um, the slides, <clears throat> we have a patient, I mean, a uh, provider portal. Um, I can go ahead and send that, uh, that link out again so you can have, um, if you don't already have availability to it, the PowerPoint, and there are two um, other pieces of information that I sent out yesterday that will be on the provider portal. There will be a drop-down menu for Hep C, and this information, along with a lot of other information, will be available on that portal. And Kim, that will be. Um, I'll have that on there next week, the early part of next week. Okay, so that so. That's Sheila with um, OUE team. She's the one, they're the ones that um, put together our portal. So she'll have that on there next week. I, if it's okay with you, Sally, I can go ahead and email that out to everyone. I thought I did that yesterday, but it may have just been those other two pieces of information. But I, I can certainly email that out to everyone as soon as um, we're through with the webinar. That's fine with me. Also, if you ever need to contact me, there's, my information is on the screen now. Uh, my email is Sally B as in boy at health.ok.gov. There's my direct extension. You just dial that previous number and that will get you directly to me. Uh, I'm happy to answer or help with anything HIV, STD, uh, hepatitis related. Or if I don't know, I can figure out who to send you to. Does anyone else have any questions? So just as a reminder, before you hang up the phone, we, uh, the department, we will have some information out um, at a later date about um, the funding for the Hep C. If you weren't on earlier, uh, we have combined the sole source contracts for the SOR grant, so everything for sole source is just going to be in one contract. And so there has been funding um, set aside or put in this contract for people that will need, um, that are at risk for Hep C that do not have the ability or the means to pay for the screens and tests themselves. And that money will be based upon how many people you're serving under your SOR contract. So, but we will have information out on a later date for that. I will, um, just as soon as we hang up, I will send out an email to everyone. It will have the PowerPoint, two pieces of other information that were provided yesterday. And then I will go ahead and attach this, uh, the link to the portal on there again. The Hep C information will not be on there until next week. So if um, there aren't any further questions, I would like to thank Sally um, very much for uh, reaching out to the department and us doing this webinar on Hep C. It's very, as you can tell, it's, um, it's a serious issue. It's very important and so, we appreciate uh, the Oklahoma Department of Health and Sally for um, for doing this. And um, that that's all I have. I hope everyone has a happy Friday and a great weekend. And